My name is Katie Metzler, and I'm the head of Methods Innovation at Sage Publishing. And I'm delighted to be chairing this evening's event, Putting Big Data to Good Use. So I'm joined tonight by four panelists, who will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then there will be time at the end for questions. So I'm going to start by introducing you to our panel. Dr. Maria Fazli is Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Institute for Analytics and Data Science at the University of Essex. In 2016, she was awarded the first UNESCO Chair in Analytics and Data Science with the aim of supporting the development of a research base and skills in data science and analytics internationally and in developing and transitioning countries in particular. Dr. Slava Mikhailov is a professor of public policy and data science at the University of Essex, holding a joint appointment in the Department of Government and the Institute for Analytics and Data Science. He's chief scientific advisor to Essex County Council and a co-investigator in the ESRC's Consumer Data Research Center at UCL. Dr. Jonathan Gray is lecturer in critical infrastructure studies at the Department of Digital Humanities, King's College London, where he is currently writing a book on data worlds and the politics of public information. He's also co-founder of the Public Data Lab and research associate at the Digital Methods Initiative at the University of Amsterdam and the Media Lab at Science Po in Paris. Ian Mulvaney is head of product innovation at Sage Publishing and is responsible su for supporting the development of tools that can help social science researchers work with big data. He's passionate about creating digital tools that support the research enterprise. Previously, Ian was head of technology at eLife Sciences had a product at Mendeley, Mendeley and a product manager for a number of nature publishing groups, online services for researchers. And so I've introduced them in the order that they're sitting here. So please join me first in welcoming our speakers. So the timing of this event, I think, feels very apt. Big data headlines are appearing daily across our newspapers, and magazines and are spreading through our social media channels. Last week, Facebook, Twitter, and Google were in front of a congressional committee in Washington to answer questions about Russia's attempts to influence last year's US presidential election by spreading misinformation online. In the UK, an article in The Observer on Brexit tells of a shadowy global operation involving big data and billionaire friends of Trump who use micro-targeting of political advertising to suppress voter segments and influence the outcome of the referendum vote. A few weeks ago, a Fortune headline asked, is, is big data killing democracy? And last week's Economist cover answered with a smoking gun of a yes. And as if that weren't scary enough, it seems it isn't just democracy that is being threatened. In Kathy O'Neill's recent book, Weapons of Math Destruction, she gives examples of how big data and predictive proprietary algorithms are being used to maximize profits and reduce costs for businesses, with damaging effects for whole swathes of the population, but especially for already disadvantaged groups. One example for, of this from Kathy's book is, a, is the predatory targeted advertising carried out by for-profit universities in the US, which has left thousands of vulnerable students with mountains of debt. Another example that's made the news um, and is featured in Kathy's book is the use of big data and reoffending risk al algorithms in the US penal system, which have been written in a way that guarantees black defendants will be inaccurately identified as future criminals more often than their white counterparts. From these various news stories and from Kathy's book, some common criticisms of the way big data is being collected and used emerge. Firstly, there's the issue of consent. Though we've all ticked a box at some point to agree to Facebook's, Facebook's terms and conditions, did any of us read them all the way through? I know I didn't. Or did we know that Cambridge Analytica would come along and use our Facebook data to build a model that helped the Believe campaign micro-target political ads? There's also an issue with the way in which algorithms are perceived as scientific and objective, despite the fact that human biases can and often are baked into their design. Related to that, there's a, there's a lack of transparency around how some algorithms work, especially when they are proprietary. 
Kathy O'Neill and many, many others have talked about the danger of the black, spot, black box al algorithm and the danger of a model which doesn't update or self-correct when new information becomes available. And who's actually regulating these algorithms to ensure they aren't racist or sexist, for example? In many cases, it's nearly impossible for an individual to fight back if they find they're unfairly scored by a company's algorithm. Again, in Kathy's book, she talks of teachers fired due to algorithmic, algorithmic scoring, credit denied, jobs not offered. The consequences can be widespread and destructive, and it seems especially for those who are already disadvantaged. But, and this is a very important but, big data and mathematical models aren't inherently bad. Big data has the potential to do wonderful things. Big data can be used to support election monitoring in the global south, to tackle epidemics and cure diseases, to improve, improve the targeting of humanitarian aid to those who need it most. Big data is neither good nor bad inherently. It depends on the way it's used, by whom, and in the service of what outcomes. I've often wondered, actually, if I'd be less concerned about Facebook's use of targeted advertising if Clinton had been elected. For many of us in the room tonight, I expect the issue around, is around who we trust with our data and what outcomes the use of our data brings about. And so, with that, I'm going to hand over to the panel to talk us through some examples of how big data is being used for social good and some of the challenges facing academics who are striving to put data, big data to better use in ways that reduce inequality and improve outcomes for society. So, Professor Fasley, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for the introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maria Fasli, and I'm the director of the Institute for Analytics and Data Science at the University of Essex. So I want to start by first uh, making a few things clear. Uh, you will have heard the term big data, uh, analytics, data science, and very often people are confused. They use this terminology interchangeably. Um, perhaps sometimes in their own way, or they may be meaning different things. So uh, let's be a bit clear. So data science is the emerging discipline, uh, the science, uh, whose purpose is to drive progress and development in this, um, in this area by uh, basically developing novel methods for processing, understanding, and drawing insights from, from data. So it's, uh, it's this new uh, science that is emerging, but very much interdisciplinary. My own personal view is that it's not just computer science or statistics, or it can be claimed by uh, social science. It, it's, um, it, it brings a lot of things uh, together. So um, you will also have heard the term analytics. I'm not entirely sure you can read uh, what my slide says here. And when, when we talk about analytics, basically what we refer to is the use of um, quantitative methods, artificial intelligence method, statistical methods to, uh, to uh, mine uh, the data sets that we, that we have. So it's basically the application of uh, different types of methods, quantitative methods on, on data. Uh, and when we talk about big data, big data is basically a huge volume of data it may be data that is structured or unstructured, but um, when we use the terminology big data, we typically refer to data sets that are uh, not that easy to handle with conventional means, as in um, put them on an Excel spreadsheet and uh, process them on your laptop or on a typical PC. So big data represents truly huge volumes of data. And for a company or an organization to claim that they have big data, they really must have large volumes of data. So as I said, typical spreadsheets are not uh, what, I would, uh, what we would call uh, big data. So I hope it's a, it's a bit clearer what we are talking about. Um, and um, uh, big data does not necessarily mean uh, big knowledge. And I have the big here in parentheses because the same is the case with uh, 
your conventional data sets. Just because you have data doesn't mean that you have knowledge. There is a distinction that we need to make. So data uh, is structured records of transactions. When you go to your bank and you uh, take money out or you deposit money, a transaction takes place, that's, that's data. Information, um, you, you have information when you basically process the data that you have and then um, you extract some meaning. So information has meaning and shape. And knowledge is something different. Knowledge is you are trying to understand what is leading to what. Uh, cause and effect. You are looking for something deeper rather than just processing uh, the data and extracting some information. So I would just like to make this distinction between these three terms as they're being used. Because for me as a scientist, they're really important. So just because people claim that they have data or big data, it does not necessarily mean that they have uh, the knowledge or they know how to extract knowledge. They may be able to partially process data, but it takes an awful lot more to be able especially to process big data and to process big data in an appropriate way. So um, at, at this point, um, I have to say, we take big data, we take data, and we take computational technologies for granted here in the developed world. But this is not the case necessarily across the world. This is a map that was produced back in 2015, and it shows uh, basically the internet uh, users as a percentage of the population in different countries. And as you can see in Africa, um, if you are able to read the... Um, uh, the, the percentages there. Africa, for instance, is one of the countries where internet uptake is not, as you can expect, very high. So just because we take things for granted here in the developed countries, it doesn't necessarily mean that the technology and the advances that the technological changes have brought to our lives have actually trickled down. Uh, so we need to be aware of this. And it's not just what is called the digital divide. So it's not just the lack of infrastructure that we are talking about. We are also talking about the lack of skills. Because you may have the infrastructure in place, but if people don't know uh, what to do with the data that is being produced, then there's not much they can do, they can do about it. So uh, that brings us uh, to the sustainable development goals uh, and data science. And you will have all heard, I guess, the um, sustainable development goals as an initiative that um, almost all the countries in the world have signed up for. That was back in 2015. 17 uh, sustainable development goals uh, that aim to basically alleviate poverty and uh, address issues with climate change and education and a number of other things in the next 15 years. As I said, 17 uh, development goals and a number of them have to do with skills and infrastructure and uh, education. So that's where my work as the uh, chair in, as the UNESCO chair in analytics and data science comes in. Because uh, in, my, in my view, as I said earlier, we have a digital divide, we also have a skills divide, and we can only bridge this divide if we actually start doing something about it and we transfer the skills to the developing countries and the transitioning countries where this is mostly uh, needed. So the aim of the UNESCO chair is to work together with international collaborators to try and bridge this digital this skills divide by making sure that research researchers across the world uh, are actually trained in the most up-to-date methods. They work together with people that um, work in, uh, in universities here in the UK, for instance, and we jointly develop projects and we, we, uh, we upskill them. But the aim of the chair is not just to upskill researchers, it's in general to upskill people, and that means uh, upskilling professionals in developing countries or uh, even school children, teachers, government officials, because they have to do a lot uh, with data. So in my view, the road to knowledge societies is through education and upskilling. Uh, and if we are able to transfer skills, uh, then this is going to lead to economic growth uh, because people are going to have the right skills so uh, they can feed back into the economy, they can create new jobs, they can create new companies, uh, they can become the techno-entrepreneurs of the, of the future. 
and they can come up with wonderful ideas, uh, especially in developing and transitioning countries because they have not been uh, accustomed to technology and they have not been the same sort of uh, periods of um, change that we have been. So when new technologies are being introduced, they can look at these with uh, completely fresh eyes and they come with astonishing uh, ideas, as some uh, examples I, I can uh, talk to you later about that if you're interested to know more. So uh, education and upskilling can bring in economic growth, uh, which can further lead to improved services for all. Uh, because if you uh, upskill not just the professionals in a country, but government officials, then they can understand the needs of the population better, they can target services better according to the needs of the population, which would mean that the services that you deliver are targeted. So for instance, if we talk about health services, then you can target them where they are needed rather than have surgeries spread, uh, for instance, across uh, the country, uh, across a specific country in the same way. If you are able to identify that there's a specific need through the data that you have, provided that the people can uh, process the data and they can extract knowledge, then you can have targeted uh, service delivery. And not only that, but actually this can lead to uh, transparency and accountability and in essence you can have improved governance in these countries uh, as well as participation through participation in public life. When people understand data, they can read data, they can uh, hold into account their governments, organizations, businesses, and this is a good thing, and we should strive for this. So initiatives that we've been undertaking under the UNESCO chair, they involve working together, as I was saying earlier, with international partners uh, to upskill um, researchers, to upskill professionals in developing and transitioning countries. And my firm belief is that in order to make progress uh, in this area, e what is needed is a cross-disciplinary. Uh, approach. I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I gave you a definition, well, not a definition, but I did say that data science is emerging discipline um, that is, is bringing together different areas. Uh, so you, we really need to uh, have a cross-disciplinary approach. It's not just about developing the novel methods to draw insights from data. It's about making sure that the methods that we develop, we understand them, so that we don't have the kind of problems uh, that Katie has been referring to. We don't have algorithms that are producing outcomes that we cannot understand. And I can bring you examples of current machine learning techniques, for instance, deep learning, that are referred to as black boxes, uh, and uh, they are very often accused of not being um, able to give you an answer as to why it is that they are uh, giving you a, a particular prediction. Uh, these algorithms may appear to be racist, at times simply because of the data that you, you feed them with, and we need to be aware of these. So the people that are developing these technologies and these methods need to work together with the social scientists because there's an impact on society, but also with the legislators, the policy makers, so that the problems that we are all gonna be facing going forward uh, are, are basically uh, addressed in a joint up way rather than after the fact we are trying um, to, uh, to change uh, outcomes and make sure that we don't have problems going forward. And on this note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. Thank you. Right, so thank you very much for inviting and um, thank you for coming here. When Katie put together the panel, the idea was that she will start off um, scaring us all that big data is really bad and the big brother is around and we should be really concerned. And our job was to be uplifting and give some examples where big data can work. So Maria has done a great job laying the foundation, but um, thinking about the examples where it should work, and being really uplifting, let me talk about climate change. <laughs> so, I, I don't know how much you can see from the slide, but essentially on the left hand side, this is a picture, well, this is a slide from 
CDC, Center for Disease Control uh, in the US, and it's about the link between climate change and public health. It's about the intersection of the two aspects. So we, everybody's concerned about public health. We are all concerned about health. This is one issue that we can relate to. Climate change, as we know, is a bit of a questionable uh, topic. Some people, on, even on this side of the Atlantic, may be skeptical about climate change. And it's really difficult to drive the point that climate change is happening. And even the US government has just released a report that climate change is happening. It's human-made activity. But it's still difficult to convince some people, right? So one of the ideas that um, a lot of academics had was, let's link together an issue that everybody can relate to and an issue that is still fundamentally important for us, but really difficult to relate to for some people through skepticism. So it's relating public health and uh, climate change. What is the effect of climate change on public health? So in this Center for Disease Control, it's, um, it's relating essentially to everything we have. Anything we can think of about climate change, it has an effect. So this is an example from Public Health England. They've done a study quite a few years back, thinking about trying to predict what would be the spread of the disease in England with the increase in temperature. And the map, since you cannot read any of that, um, the map is picking up the spread of potentially the spread of malaria. And um, that's at the top. This is a map from um, we're talking about 19th century and the cases in 19th century of malaria in England. And here are several scenarios of development where we will end if we don't do anything or where we will end if we still try to do something but it's not enough. And as you can see, it is expanding quite a lot and malaria coming back and potentially coming back in in such a way that um, some parts of London are appearing as purple, right? <laughs> Which is really bad according to the map. Um, Colchester, on the other hand, University of Essex seems to be fine, so we, you're all welcome. You can all come to Colchester. Right, so this is the backdrop, and this is, I'm, I'm still trying to be a bit uplifting there because Katie gave us a task to be uplifting. So, what do we do about that? This is the problem, this is the setting. So one of the things that um, we can look at, how do international leaders think about public health? How do international leaders think about climate change and public health in particular, in the intersection between them? So in part of our research, um, we looked at the debates in the United Nations. So we, this is the debate in the United Nations at every session, opening of United Nations. The, Leaders, country leaders, heads of state, heads of government, all their representatives, they come and speak. So this is usually in September for the first couple of days. This is called the opening of the General Assembly, and the debate is called the General Debate. Usually country leaders come and they speak about the most important problems that face their countries. Theresa May spoke about Brexit, about immigration. Um, Barack Obama spoke about Iran, spoke about North Korea, but also about all kinds of other global issues like ISIS. And the president of Kiribati, he spoke about climate change because for Kiribati, this is an issue that is really, um, it's important. The country will disappear. They all face extinction as a country. They will have to move. So for him, this is the most important issue. So what we try to see is, does climate change and the discussion of climate change in the relationship to public health, does it move not only from the countries most affected, but also does it appear in species from the developed um, leaders of the developed countries? Theresa May, Barack Obama, or oh, Donald Trump this year, right? So um, this was done as part of a project that is under the um, Lancet, the medical journal, the premier medical journal Lancet, Lancet Countdown Commission. So this is a report that was commissioned by Lancet, and the report was specifically to track the intersection of climate change and public health. The report was just launched on Monday, and it's in public domain, so anyone can download if you so we get to read about it. It's, a, it's quite a long report. Our job within the report was really tiny. We were one of the working groups, one of the smaller working groups, tracking the engagement uh, public and political engagement with the issue of climate change and uh, public health. So what we did, we looked at all the speeches over the last 10 years and tried to see how many times does climate change appear in the context of public health. 
So do the leaders, when they speak about it, does the context um, provide for this intersection between the two issues? Because we know that it happens in some countries, but we don't know about other countries. So the top graph here, just the ballpark figure, is to tell you that it does appear, but it also fluctuates. And one thing that it, we can see is that it fluctuates in the run-up to a major climate change uh, summit. Politicians talk a lot about this issue, specifically the intersection of public health and climate change. As soon as the summit is over, they stop talking about it, until the next summit. So if we think about as citizens, if we want to engage and we want to drive this issue forward, the awareness of climate change and public health, one of the things we can do is put it on the agenda, not with the fluctuations up and down, but a bit more even. It's always on the agenda. If it's on the agenda, something will, will have to be done, hopefully. But also countries speak differently. So the Pacific speaks, countries from the Pacific region, they speak a lot about the issue. Countries from Western Europe, they almost never discuss the issue, the intersection of public health and climate change. So again, it's working in different areas, raising the awareness. So that's the positive spin on that. So we can do something and we can raise the awareness, we can engage with the issue that is seems to be an intractable issue by itself, but we can engage with it by using some of the data science techniques. So specifically underneath of that, it's uh, applying some of the things from natural language processing, some of the things from machine learning and natural language processing to identify the trends, analyze the data, convert text into data, and analyze that for public good here specifically. And just as a brief overview, these are all the other headline indicators that you can look at in the full report on the Lancet website. And all of them are telling that there's a, unless we do something now, it will be pretty dire. <laughs> but we can, um, we can do things. And I think this is the point, is that we can do things and we can move forward. Great. So um, I'm going to talk to you um, now about uh, a entity which I've uh, co-founded called the Public Data Lab. Um, and specifically, I'm going to look at not just the analytical capacities of big data technologies and how they can be used, but also um, the social life of some of these different capacities and the way in which data is put to work in different sorts of institutional contexts and the infrastructures and techniques and things that it depends on. Um, and specifically, I'm going to look at some experiments in participation using digital methods and data infrastructures um, that we've started to do um, with the Public Data Lab and which um, uh, many of its partners and its network have, have been doing for some, some time. Before I do that, I'm going to quickly explain a little bit about um, the... Uh, the way that I come at this, which is um, through my current work on data worlds. And what I'm particularly interested in this work is how digital technologies are being used to redistribute uh, different sorts of public data worlds. And by data worlds, I'm just going to kind of briefly explain the three things that I'm particularly interested in. Um, the first is this notion of horizons of intelligibility. So how are things made meaningful or experienceable or um, uh, how could we reason with things uh, uh, using data? Um, I think this kind of relates to several of the points that we've seen earlier, like what data is collect collected about what uh, different sorts of issues and what different sorts of phenomena in the world and how. Um, the second, I guess, is this idea of social world. So, you know, as we were saying earlier, the, uh, the, if you look at anything from a National Statistics Institute to um, a sort of uh, a social media company, there are going to be these whole teams of people who are involved in creating, using and making meaning with this data. And I think this is there's a fantastic uh, classics of sociological work called Art Worlds by Howard Becker, where he makes exactly this point very well, that you don't just look at you know, this beautiful Eduardo Palozzi on the wall, you have to look at all of the things like the frame and the, uh, all of the different sorts of work that go on in order to enable us to see this on the wall as a picture with these various kinds of conventions um, that, that we have that means this is meaningful as, as a cultural artefact. The final thing is transnational political projects to reshape the world through data. So, how are we seeing different sorts of alliances, different sorts of uh, relationships between not only um, you know, countries, but also uh, large uh, corporations and research institutes and NGOs and sort of other, other entities. So to summarize, I think there are different ways of creating and organizing and use, using data, which enable different sorts of what we might call epistemic 
social and political possibilities, different sorts of ways of knowing uh, uh, the world through, uh, through data. And the thing that we're interested in with the lab is how can we make space for reflection and intervention around these different sorts of data worlds, everything from uh, the sorts of data that we see from large technology companies through to the SDGs and new sorts of indicators within the public sector and beyond. Um, and so we're interested in experiments and participation, public imagination, deliberation, and mobilization around these emerging data infrastructures and data worlds through a combination of digital methods, digital data, participatory design, as well as social and humanistic research, which, which will be familiar to, to many of you, um, um, you know, if, if you're here at this event run by SAGE. Um, so one of the things that we've drawn is, is this notion uh, from this artificial intelligence researcher called critical technical practice, which uh, Agre this sort of, uh, describes as um, the process of having one foot planted in the craft work of design and the other foot in the uh, reflective work of critique. And in a similar vein, we're interested in developing what you might consider a critical data practice, where we are uh, combining the craft of working with data with critical reflection on data and the social and historical processes of its making. Um, and this is something I think many of our colleagues who are involved in the lab have also been working on, uh, which is not just about analysis, as, as our colleague uh, Notcha Marez says, but also about the different forms of interactivity, the different sorts of social relations which are made possible through data. Um, so with the lab, we, uh, we have these themes of uh, facilitating research, democratic engagement, and public debate around the future of the data society. And we have a number of different um, uh, researchers and research networks who are involved. Um, oh, I see there's, uh, there's, there's several slides missing. Uh, okay. No. Yeah, there's a few missing. Never mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, uh, you have to imagine the pictures uh, about one of our uh, projects, which is um, a field guide to fake news, which is what we've been doing uh, with SAGE and which we're also working um, uh, we're sort of in discussion about a sort of potential book project. Um, but the idea essentially was to take this uh, hugely mediated and politicised notion of fake news um, as a site for experimentation around the way in which you can use uh, different forms of data and digital methods and infrastructures in order to understand what fake news is, how people are making meaning with it, how it's being shared and so on. And there are, there are three things that I was going to show. Um, uh, and I guess the emphasis of this project was not just to look at how one could instrumentally use um, uh, data and methods in order, to, uh, in order to kind of crack down on fake news, but also to give a different picture about what fake news is and what it tells us about the different sorts of media in ecosystems and platforms which are increasingly entangled with many areas of social life. So there are three things I'm going to show you. Um, in fact, I could... No, I'm not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> the temptation is to go on the web and show you. But uh, there are three things that I was going to talk about. The first is, um, uh, uh, just apart from looking at the volume of sharing, which is a kind of very common thing that you see in sort of many newspapers, like how much fake news was shared, particularly ahead of the US elections. We were instead looking at where it was shared, by whom, who's making meaning with it, what sorts of things is it being, um, is it being used in order to do in the world. And this, this immediately sort of reframes the problem, not as something of, um, of kind of rogue information or sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of these metaphors of the virus that's infecting the host body of these passive publics. And instead we're looking at the role that people play in uh, using this information and how it reinforces different sorts of sense of political identity and um, people feeling like they're not being heard. And sometimes there's also satire and all kinds of other things that are going on. I think it's quite important to look at. Um, the second thing uh, that we were looking at is the social life of fake news online. So taking a few of these different stories and following them through um, from, uh, from where they started to uh, how them being spread by uh, in various different media sources and groups. And one of the things that we found quite interesting is if you, if you do this, you can see that you know, one of the most famous claims is uh, Pope supports Trump, right? Which is uh, one of the most sort of widely uh, sort of shared of these sort of fake news stories in the run-up to the US elections. One of the things that we did in following this through was uh, you can see it starts life as satire. So it's very clearly uh, sort of on a satirical website and it's laundered by uh, a, what, we, what we describe in the project as a laundering agent, and then it, it triggers these various responses by uh, fact-checkers, by media organisations and others, kind of picking it up and referring to it, which then, in effect, perpetuates the life of this thing. And studying that, studying how things move around, gives us a very different sort of picture about what fake news is, 
and um, how important the way in which it's shared is to it as a sort of phenomenon. It isn't just about things not being true, it's also about the media ecosystems and, and, and infrastructures which make this phenomenon possible. The final thing um, that we did in the project, which again I had some pictures you have to imagine in your head, is uh, thinking about um, the techno commercial underpinnings you might consider of, of, of fake news. So Obama was said to be extremely concerned in the, in the final days of his, um, his, his being in office about Macedonian teenagers. And Macedonian teenagers were said to be kind of spreading this material uh, uh, and making huge amounts of money on their phones. Um, and and it's, just, it's very lucrative. And the, the, the line was, we don't actually care what it is that we're sharing. We've just done some testing with different sorts of groups. And it turns out that um, Trump groups apparently seem to really like this stuff. So we kind of seed it there and we make sort of advertising revenue. So what we're doing was investigating those sorts of claims by looking at trackers or tiny bits of code which are embedded in these different websites and using that to understand um, how uh, people were monitoring uh, the flow of these things online in different settings, and we were looking at the difference between mainstream media organisations' use of trackers and um, uh, the use of trackers on fake news websites, and seeing different sorts of footprints. And by that, you can then start to identify these clusters of, um, uh, of, sort of uh, the, the media groups, as it were, of uh, how fake news is being shared. So the final thing I was going to say was, um, that is an example uh, with the lab of how uh, we're looking at not just the analytical possibilities of big data and uh, data technologies and data infrastructures, but also how they're put to work in different social settings. We're interested in substantive experiments which involve others outside of, um, uh, outside of research. So in this case, we're working with journalists, we work with BuzzFeed News, the New York Times, NRC, and a number of other media outlets. And of course, as you know, many of you have alluded to, uh, genuinely interdisciplinary work in this sense is really hard because it involves different ways of seeing the world through data, it involves different sorts of methods, different sorts of priorities. But nevertheless, um, this is something that we feel is important if we care about the way in which data is put to work in the world. Um, and, and it will take hard work and it will, you know, I'm sure uh, there's, there's, there's all kinds of policy and institutional work that needs to happen to support this. So the three or four areas that we're kind of looking at next are um, air pollution, uh, data in cities, data and democracy, and um, f continue to look at fake news in France and Germany. So if, you're, if you happen to be interested in those topics, then um, we'd love to hear from you. That's it. All right, thank you very much. So how many people in the room here would associate yourselves with the social sciences? Can I see a show of hands? So there's loads of people in the room. That's great. So thinking back on some of the things we've heard today, you know, we at SAGE, when, when we think about who gets to look at this data that's being generated, when we get to think about which groups get to play in this arena, and when we think about who is going to be responsible for building these algorithms that will take control of our lives, at SAGE, we passionately believe that all of you in this room, all of those people who are associated with the social sciences need to have a seat at that table and need to be involved in those discussions. Even though you might think of us as just being a publisher, what we do is we try to build bridges to knowledge. We want to build bridges between the worlds of big data and the social sciences. So what I'm going to talk about today is sort of fairly concrete. I'm going to talk about how we as a publisher understood the needs that might exist in this gap how we picked an area that we could try to affect change in that gap, and what we've done about that over the last year. So here we go. So uh, Sage Publishing, is an, we are an independent publisher. We were founded in 1965. Um, and the way we try to understand the needs gap around big data for the social sciences is uh, we did a survey of about 9,500 participants, I have to say. My colleague Katie here was heavily involved in that survey. I came in later. Um, we got uh, a good set of re responses. We actually surveyed, I think, about half a million people uh, to get about 9,500 responses. And then we crunched that data. We got a lot of, of, of results. Um, we did the analysis, but the results ultimately boiled down to social scientists telling us that they had challenges around access to skills, access to the raw data, access to creating good collaborations, 
um, access to good quality software and understanding how to work with that software and problems of getting credit when working in interdisciplinary domains. And now, the speakers on our panel here are great representatives of people who've been able to get past these challenges, but what we found was that most social scientists are still struggling with one or other of the challenges on this screen. Does, does this look uh, uh, like something that any of you in the room would recognize as problems that you might have in getting started with big data? Maybe not, okay, so we can keep moving. They nodded. Okay, we got, we got some nods, that's good. All right, so, so that's our, those are our, our substantive problems as we understand them that social science, scientists have in getting started with working with this kind of material. But what, to, what are we going to do about that? So uh, a little over a year ago, we decided to create within SAGE a small innovation incubator to take this information on board and try to come up with ideas about how we could help in this domain. Um, we came up with a mission. Uh, our mission is to improve social science by giving every researcher the skills and tools that they need to work effectively with big data and new technology, which essentially er the skills and tools that all of you need to work with big data and new technology. Um, we decided not to tackle the getting credit part within our incubator group because we felt that that was something that was being dealt well by other areas of, of Sage's publishing business. So that focused us on these other four key areas of need, skills, data, collaboration, and software. And uh, it was a very interesting process to go through. We adopted methodologies from lean startup and from lean product development, taking uh, leafs out of the playbooks of the companies from Silicon Valley who are actually building this kind of new big data world that we're coming to live in. Um, these are some of the techniques that we use to try and understand some of our product ideas and concept ideas. But in effect, what we were doing is we were running little mini micro experiments. And those experiments were trying to help us invalidate our ideas as quickly as possible so we could move on to try and find an idea that would actually be something we could do in, in a reasonable amount of time that could provide value for the community. And a lot of this work was just done using post-it notes, people in a room, talking to a lot of academics, talking to a lot of social scientists. Um, eventually, we came up with the first viable idea, and when I say eventually, it was within about a four or five week period of time, which was to target trying to create an area where we could produce skills uh, and give researchers the ability to learn some of these skills themselves through creating an online set of courses. Uh, we did a little throwaway test by setting up a landing page. There was no, at this stage, there were no product behind this. This was just a landing page where we tested the hypothesis of whether people like yourselves would be interested in learning these skills for various price points, and we got quite a bit of traction. We discovered that people would be quite interested in doing this. So we started in March of this year, and between March and September, we went out and built an online learning platform for social scientists to get some of these skills. Um, these are the courses that we ran. We found that people were interested in learning things like Python, R, visualization, uh, data science methods, and fundamentals of quantitative text analysis. So that's what we did. Um, the courses are in the process of wrapping up the first set of courses. Uh, we've gotten really good feedback from the community. Um, but I just step back a bit. The reason we've done this is because we're trying to put our weight behind initiatives that can help you as a community get the skills that you need to work with the kinds of substantive questions that the people on the panel today have been talking about. And this has just been our first initiative. This is something that we've been able to build and put together in about seven months. But when we go back to thinking about the landscape of other wider needs that people in this community have to be able to work with this kind of materiality and this kind of information, there are dozens of other ideas that are out there. And if any of you have ideas that you think you are passionate about seeing someone like Sage get involved with, please come up and talk to me afterwards because we want to continue iterating on our, our thinking and iterating on the kinds of things that we can offer to you as a community. There are other challenges, challenges around ethics, challenges around industry capturing research. We're seeing that a lot of people who have these kinds of skills are migrating into industry. Uh, access to data is one that we haven't been able to crack. Um, Questions around co-creation of tools rather than adoption of tools. Are people just picking up tools from other disciplines because they seem to be easy to use to work with data? Or is it better for you as a community to build your own tools with the understanding of the theories and grounding of how you want to work with that data from the first, pla part, port, first place? Also recreating the wheel, trying to get that balance between taking where you can and inventing where you need to. 
Uh, we created a white paper, we published a white paper on some of our findings. Uh, this is the link to that white paper. And those are the things that I wanted to tell you about. Thank you very much. Okay, so now is the fun part where everyone gets to grill the panel. So there should be a microphone um, coming around. Does anyone want to start us off with a question? Otherwise, I will. All right, I'll, while you're all thinking of your excellent questions, I will ask the first one. So actually, my first question is back to the um, introduction that I gave around how sort of concerned we should be versus hopeful we should feel. Um, and that's actually to each of the, the panel members. I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about how you read all of these news stories that we're seeing all, of, all over the place. And as people who are actually working in the field, Um, so I think we, you need to maintain a balanced view. Unfortunately, being in the discipline and understanding some, um, how some of these methods uh, work can make you paranoid. Uh, and if you do indeed read the Facebook uh, terms and conditions, and they do run into hundreds of pages, you will realize that you are signing quite a lot away, so you need to be careful when you are uploading uh, photos. But you need to, you need to maintain a, a balanced view on this. You can use data for good and you can use data, and I'm talking about using analytics methods on data for, um, for, for bad purposes or you may uh, cause damage unintentionally. Uh, that's why I said uh, that we, we need to work together. Sometimes when you read the news it can be quite scary. Um, but we have been through other industrial revolutions in the past when things uh, looked as if they are going to go down uh, a route where people didn't necessarily understand what was going to happen next. And we've managed to pull through. Uh, and if we are able to uh, put together our, our collective efforts, if you like, and I'm talking about the disciplines coming together, so this data science discipline, that's why I was so insistent on this being interdisciplinary. It's not about just developing the methods. Um, computer scientists, developers need to understand there are going to be implications of their methods being used. Uh, and if we start talking about other methods like artificial intelligence methods, for instance, and methods that can profile you, you can understand why, why, why people are getting perhaps uh, understandably at this moment in time uh, concerned. But we need to have a balanced view. Um, and we need to have the social sciences perspective because all of these technological changes and all of these analytics methods, they do have an impact on our lives and we do need the policy makers and the, um, the, the, the legislators to work together to address this really big problem that we're going to have because technology is not going to stop. We're not going to stop developing these methods but we need to make sure that individual rights are protected and we use these methods for the, for the benefit of society and for the benefit of, in, of individual. Um, I guess, I mean, I, I, can't, I have this, is, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but I have this, like, completely um, unshakable and profound optimism. <laughs> but, like, in the really, really far future. Like, so, <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to feel optimistic about what's going to happen imminently, right? Um, but I think that in the, if you, look, if you look far, far, far in the future, maybe things aren't necessarily so bad. But I guess um, what, what, the, what really interests me at the moment is actually in terms of, so, so a lot of my, my research at the moment is kind of, uh, is not just about using these different sorts of methods, but also about studying how different sorts of data and methods are put to work in the world in different ways. And the thing that interests me a lot at the moment is how to go beyond um, the imaginaries, because there, there's a lot about this, it's not just with the infrastructure, it's not just with the practices, about how we imagine uh, data to play a role in our societies. And there's, there's, there's huge things that this draws on in, in the world, you know, um, from kind of modernism and democracy and science and all, all sorts of other things that we kind of imagine are, are part of the world and sort of play a particular uh, role in the world. But I think the, the thing that interests me at the moment is to kind of go beyond some of the imaginaries we have about transparency on the one hand, 
and privacy on the other hand. So, and this applies from everything to algorithms. I don't think that at the moment, just thinking about algorithms in terms of seeing under the hood. And this is a point that sort of Kate Crawford and uh, Mike and Annie have made very eloquently recently, which is we are actually part of these systems. It's not as though we can just look inside what's happening at a number of technology companies and have a better understanding of what's going on. We are um, entangled with them in very fundamental ways. So the way that Google search works, the way that these algorithms are optimized, responds to the social life around them in ways which mean that when you talk about an algorithm being racist, it's not just, the, it's not just what happens in the co at a code level inside a technology company. There's all kinds of other things that are going on there, which I think is very important to unpack. Which leads me to the second point, which is that this isn't just about who has access to what and when. It's also about how these systems are configured, which, which leads you to very important um, social, political, and ethical questions about what is measured and how, which is uh, something that anyone who's, who's a sort of social scientist and familiar with the sort of history of methods will be deeply aware of, which is to do with how you configure these apparatuses for knowing the world in different ways um, and who, who kind of shapes them in a much more substantive way than who just gets access to their fruits. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, just a couple points. I, I'm also optimistic, but in a not that far future. I think it's much shorter term. We, we're not really that far off from a lot of things working at a, at a level that is comfortable for us to use it. So, Facebook terms and conditions are impenetrable, and I don't know, maybe Marie is the only person who read them. <laughs> My husband, actually. Okay, <laughs> that's absolutely fine. But lawmakers and policymakers are catching up with the governance. If you think about that, the third wave of AI revolution roughly started 2006, 2007. It is really recent where this abundance of data is pushing the boundaries and it is developing. But in the meantime, we did come up with a lot of regulation already. And May 2018, GDPR, the new data protection coming in, more and more things are being put in. Um, and as, as a user, as a person who is trying to work with the public data, and this is probably one of the answers to the question, to the questionnaire for social scientists is access to data. It is really difficult today to gain access to data from public sector. It is probably easier if you work for a private company and you get access to within private. So probably easier for Google to get access to Google data, but it's almost impossible to get access to public data because of all the regulations in place, risk aversion also. Nobody wants to be on the headlines of Daily Mail, but it's, it's part of life now that everybody understands the drawbacks. And partly it is the self-regulating thing that is also playing. So we have bad examples of some people would think bad examples of Cambridge Analytica. Some people would really enjoy the fruits of Cambridge Analytica work. But uh, we, have, we have things like Cambridge Analytica, but we also have GDPR, we have data protection. And we have a lot of governance mechanisms that are already in place. So I'm much more optimistic and for much shorter term. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also an, an optimist. I think, uh, like, uh, if I think back to my life, I was born in 1974, like the internet didn't exist. Uh, the ability for the web to connect people to create micro communities is something that has just transformed my experience of the world and the world itself I think when you look at it at very broad levels has many indicators that are improving child uh, literacy child is increasing child mortality is going down the number of wars are going down and those are things that we tend to like neglect to look at when we think about these questions about existential risk because we're always thinking about the really flashy exciting risky questions. And when you talk about big data in AI, the, the things that can become manifest are, will AIs become self-aware and, and eat humans or turn us all into paper clips? Uh, and I, you know, I, I just don't, I don't buy that in any way. I do see regulation increasing. Um, and I think one of the other things that I think see, I see happening over the next sort of five to six years is that many of these techniques which seem a little alien to us today will become completely commoditized and completely normalized in our life and, ver and very comfortable for us to work with. And with that comfort will come expectations around extra regulation. So I'm, I'm definitely on the optimistic side. On the other hand, every now and again, a story does come along which makes you go, ooh, that is a little bit scary. But I think it's important to keep those in context. Do you have a plan 
for making some of the data that you possess available to researchers and what is the governance mechanism that you would propose for doing that in a way which means that um, there can be some sort of access to but also uh, oversight of the way in which their data is being put to work. I think that's the single thing that I'll ask. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see. So if you're swinging by any of the other technological companies along the way when you're talking to Facebook, <laughs> the same question can be exactly the same thing can be asked of any one of them. Yeah. I was just going to say that I mean, the, 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 the thing that actually was really fascinating was um, the, 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 one of the big approaches to fake news, and it's just about fake news, was that material started to disappear. And that actually makes it quite difficult for researchers to understand um, what, this, what material is being produced and how it's circulating. It is also a byproduct of their approach of these flagging mechanisms. So one of the things that I think um, many of us have proposed who worked on this project is, uh, would they consider something like an archive? Yeah. Like an archive of fake news, as ridiculous as it sounds. I and mean, that's just one case, but I think it would be tremendously valuable. Um. So if Facebook can fix it, that that will be uh, trailblazing for all the other companies and for social science researchers. That's one thing that it often takes one, and hopefully it could be Facebook. It takes one, and then with a proper governance mechanism, as an example, it could work. If it works, then the other companies will also follow. The data access issue, the governance, the data access. So it's, I think it's it boils down to one question. Yeah, I think it's the big question for us. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would second that. It's the data access because the wealth of data, the richness of the, the data that you would have there from a social science as well as a computational point of view would be absolutely incredible to work with. So it, if that could be uh, arranged, uh, I think you would have immense gratitude mm -hmm. from a really big community of researchers. So... No pressure. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? It would be fascinating to be able to use data from Facebook to create personal histories of people and in the years to come see the evolution of society, of individuals, of institutions, if they were going to go on for a very long time. It would be amazing. Probably not in my lifetime, but uh, you never know. Maybe AI is going to come up with some kind of chip that can be put in my brain and I can <laughs> <laughs> keep going on for a while. So any, any other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, great. I think it's a great question to answer, to ask right now, though. I mean, I, I think there's, I have a very sort of strong view on this, which is that it has to be about risk and reward. I mean, it has to be about benefits and costs. And I think one of the reasons why Sage is so keen um, to support this field of computational social science is because until we can see lots of really great examples of how data, our data is being used to improve outcomes rather than just to make companies money, I think we are right to be really worried about giving our data away. It turns out we aren't as worried maybe as we even should be. We tick lots of terms and conditions and then we're upset afterwards rather than thinking that we'll change our behavior um, and uh, perhaps not sign up for a Facebook account. But if, if we all, instead of being afraid of, of, of um, giving our data away, had lots and lots of examples of how by doing so, we had been able to uh, improve the world as cure diseases, um, you know, increase, increase um, uh, you know, benefits for society. I think that that would be quite a different question. So for, for me, it's, uh, the, the um, question has to be about how we can balance that cost and benefit. And I actually think it's very important for social scientists to be actively um, sharing examples of, of times and ways in which data is being used for public good, because I think it will help us overcome those concerns about um, data sharing. Um, just wanted to say, so it's, the individual rights is absolutely important, but 
we shouldn't be really bashing Facebook, because especially since you guys go into Facebook <laughs> quite soon. There's absolutely amazing things done using Facebook is data for public good. So I was recently at a presentation from Bangladesh, um, the equivalent of the cabinet office in Bangladesh, and they, they created Facebook, um, they used Facebook as this mechanism for people in rural areas to access public services in a way that if there's a, a, an easy way to complain about the absence of public services, I would rather say. So, and things get done. Uh, there's a feedback, and it's a short feedback mechanism because it's short on the usual writing a complaint, waiting for it to be a, a letter, waiting for it to be delivered, waiting for it to be reviewed. Now they have this, the equivalent of public uh, cabinet office in every province and every district, and citizens can directly refer, and everybody, the officials there feel accountable. And that was a dramatic change. So talking to people from the from Bangladesh, they felt that it's a dramatic change. And this was not directly thanks to Facebook, but using Facebook as an infrastructure to deliver public goods and using data for public good. I think the way that I would probably address this is to suggest that, I mean, that I think a lot of the most common policy responses, and many of the sort of research and advocacy responses focus on um, different sorts of rights and interests uh, of transparency, of privacy. Um, there's a strong sort of digital rights movement, which I think is, um, which is very important in the, in, in the context of this area. But I also think that um, one of the points that um, we sort of make a lot with the lab is that um, we also need what we describe as a kind of infrastructural imagination, which is a very sort of silly phrase, but it's, it's the idea of thinking about what these infrastructures entail which is that these aren't just technical systems, these are systems which involve many people, many different sorts of technologies, many different sorts of standards, many different sorts of committees. Some of these things are internal to the technology companies we talk about, some not. Um, different sorts of conventions and protocols. There's a whole range of different things which are involved. And I think, um, you know, also for my taste as someone who's interested in the political, his history of political thought, um, the idea that something can just only have a kind of rights-based solution seems kind of quite optimistic. Um, like there are a range of different sorts of policy, sorts of responses, political responses, but also different sorts of public debate and democratic engagement that are required over a long period of time to shape these different sorts of systems to do different things in society. I think it's interesting, a lot of the debates that we're having so far have been very much about technology companies, which is true on the one hand, but also kind of stepping back and, and seeing the kind of continuity here rather than just the novelty people have been generating, you know, maybe not big data, but quite large scale data sets about things like climate change or migration or many other things for a long time. And I think developing the capacity to have, um, you know, imagination about how we shape these things is, is, is gonna be really important, which will involve a range of different, and that's not very helpful, but uh, I think basically that would be my response is we need to think about about not just doing research with data, but also about the way in which data is created in our society. I thought it's, it's, it's everything all these people said, but there was one aspect of, what, of your comment that I want to just think about a little bit. So you said this data that, that we have, that we've created, that's incredibly valuable. And actually, it's only marginally valuable. So for any single individual for Facebook, it's worth uh, maybe a couple of dollars, maybe a couple of tens of dollars per individual per year. Um, and so it only becomes incredibly valuable at vast aggregated scales. Um, and, and there are a couple of really interesting byproducts of that, I think. So one of these byproducts is that most of the data that you produce in your digital footprints is real, just sort of exhaust. It's like lots of junk, which is really hard to interpret. You've got lots of data, very little insight. And the mechanisms, mechanics, and infrastructure you need to be able to collate that, aggregate it, and collect it into one place and make any insight from it whatsoever requires the creation and invention of entirely new tooling and methodologies for dealing with data at scale and at pace. And so I'll just put that idea there. An area where it would be clearly advantageous if we could get our, our act together around looking at data in the public sphere would be if we could co reasonably connect the health data and health profiles of all of the individuals in the NHS. And the government has wasted billions of pounds in trying to create an integrated IT system which has failed them. And so I think 
the pressure for these, from these commercial companies to be able to extract this minimal value at scale from individuals has led to systems which may potentially be able to revolutionize how things are done in the, in the public sector uh, to create services that could actually benefit us. So it's kind of a byproduct effect. And we're beginning to see the, the emergence of interesting pieces of work like ESTA in London are starting to use data science to identify delinquent landlords. But the tooling and methodologies has had to be derived because our data is only approximately marginally valuable and only gets to value at massive scale. So yeah, there are lots of questions about risk reward. How, how valuable is our data? How much privacy do we need to have control of? How do we then take advantage of the benefits of the systems that have emerged to drive the profits of these companies, but take those systems and put them into good use in the public domain? I think there are lots of interesting questions here. Um, I just want to make an invitation, really. Um, we have a project at the University of Essex which looks at human rights, big data, and technology. Uh, and as part of the project, as you can appreciate, one of the key uh, themes is to look at this intersection of human rights and the use of analytics and big data in particular. So if you're interested in rights and privacy, then I would be delighted to put you in touch with some colleagues uh, at the university and we can continue uh, this conversation because it's really important um, in the context of that project and overall to actually look at, at rights, not just human, ri I mean, human rights, and which involves a number uh, of things. So it's a, it's a really key area. One piece of evidence um, is how many social scientists these companies are hiring. So there are a lot of social scientists with computational skills who are being hired by Facebook and Google and Twitter and Microsoft, um, which says to me that they do value and need these skills because ultimately the data that they're working with is human data and they want to understand what it tells us about the humans creating the data and the humans using their products. So that is one, one example is that there is certainly a bit of a brain drain um, <laughs> going on with uh, academics being poached by um, technology companies, which um, suggests that they want the skills. Um, I think domain expertise, so social science as being one of the domains applica applications to society, domain expertise will always be important. And if you think about data science as this intersection of computer science, analytical skills, statistics, and domain expertise, that's where social science comes in. And it's really a completely different thing to get a computer scientist who does a lot of machine learning, and it will be absolutely amazing algorithms. It's going to work absolutely fine. But if you want to apply to a specific problem in society, sooner or later they will have to bring in a domain ex expert. And that's where social scientists have... Um, that's where we have a value, specifically. So that's where, that's how I ended up in the Institute for Analytics and Data Science because they needed a domain expert in about public sector and application of data science in public sector. And it's difficult to get a computer scientist involved in that, purely on that, because you need to understand the workings, how public policy is being done, how the public administration, public management is being done, if you want to apply there. And I think that's, that's much more general. So domain expertise, and I think that's where social science comes in. Yes, is the answer, <laughs> yeah. I think, but um, there's a couple of things. I guess the first is, um, again, understanding the social life of, uh, of data infrastructures and data practices and, and data technologies and what they do. Um, there's all kinds of things that can be done from, you know, ethnography and even sort of, you know, very qualitative approaches in order to understand how people are making meaning with data and how data is being put to work in many different contexts. Because I think, that, I mean, I guess which brings me on to my second point, which is a huge continuities that we have to always remember, even though the sorts of particular um, infrastructures and, and sort of tools might be uh, computationally more advanced, many of the same concepts and metaphors and ways of thinking about social life uh, are, are con uh, th there are some interesting continuities so whether it's to do with kind of the influence of graph theory or networks you know you can go back to kind of uh, jacob moreno and you know huge traditions of the social 
social scientists which have gone through physics and biology and then come back again to all other kinds of areas of um, understanding social life. But also, um, you know, understanding concepts. So, I mean, so many of these things are so heavily dependent on, you know, it's not just, this isn't just kind of te technological or computational knowledge which is, which is required to configure these different things and put them to work in, 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 in these sort of different domains that we've been talking about today. There's also an understanding of uh, conceptually what's happening, which is hugely important and which borrows heavily from many areas of the social sciences. So I think my, my answer would be uh, hugely yes. I mean, yeah. So, so if, you, if you think about um, some of these AI and machine learning algorithms, they've been presented here as, as sort of these great tools and techniques that can help you drive insight. But the dirty little secret of a lot of these algorithms is that they are hyper fine-tuned and they require a lot of nudging and there isn't a science to it. It's sort of an art. And so to get to a point where you get it to work and become a predictive tool for you, n never an explanatory tool, but even just a predictive tool, you often get into a situation where you're not quite sure what's going on and, you're not, and to get past some of that, you need some insight into, into the domain knowledge, as these people are saying. But one of the other things that's happening is, is I think, um, there's still an issue of people from, the f the f from physics backgrounds and from computer science backgrounds taking the toolkit that they learned in their domains and applying them to social data sets and beginning to think that they're making headway and having a, f uh, a great time, but really just redoing really basic work that the social sciences have done 40 years ago and wasting a lot of time. And so I think there's absolutely a need in creating a kind of a marketplace where these people can be, have a lot of their efforts short-circuited so they can get onto the really interesting question. However, right now, today, such a marketplace does not exist. It's happening in these sort of more ad hoc networks or through people going into these big companies. And I think we really have to work as a community to creating a marketplace like that to help advance the whole field and begin to make better results out of these techniques for society. I think it's really critically important. Um, absolutely, yes, social scientists are needed. Uh, in fact, desperately, uh, because you can have your computer scientists and your statisticians coming up with new uh, techniques and methods for processing data and extracting insight, as we said. But actually, the social scientists are the ones that are going to help the computer scientists and the statisticians and the developers ask the really interesting questions. Because of the way social scientists are being trained to look at data that have to do with people, that have to do with society. And computer scientists, your statisticians, they're not, we're not being trained, and I'm talking uh, from experience. I'm a computer scientist by background, so my brain has been trained in a particular way, and I will ask uh, questions around the data set, but when I work with a social scientist, because their perspective is very different to mine, that's when you get to uh, ask the really interesting questions, and then who develops the methods, we can talk about that later, but it's this intersection that is needed. And unless you have the social scientists there, I don't think you're gonna be able uh, to get the maximum value, and I'm um, putting value in quotes out of the, out of the data. So absolutely, uh, social scientists have a, an absolutely key role to play. Great. Okay, so I noticed that wasn't much of a debate at the end because we're all optimists and we all agree on social science being a really important part of this. So I apologize if there wasn't enough argument on, on the panel for you tonight. But um, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us. And if we can give everyone a round of applause. Thank you.